Vasilium.com. Let's go. Ähm, alternativ natürlich auch äh, die Domain ähm, hier 149.2.7.S34. Ähm, wir sind bei einer Stunde und acht Minuten im Improved Cyber Security Skills with CTFs. Pico CTF Walkthrough 2018 von John Hammond. Und wir schauen den Reupload von freecodecamp.org. Um, let's go. Easy get black script, right? I do like to write simple get black scripts. No matter how stupid or trivial or worthless they seem, I think it still documents the solution or documents uh, the work that we did and kind of just the understanding of the challenge to, to I don't know, just memorialize our work, you know? How can I say I don't know and then I say you know, like as if. As if I've actually made a point, it's weird. I should stop. All right, cool. Um, Got that ist ja alles noch voll intakt hier, der ganze Kabel und so, den ich immer gesetzt habe. Hope you're enjoying these videos. Entspannte uh, Sachen. I am. We can mark this challenge as complete and just keep rocking for more on Pico CTF 2018. Der Turm steht auch noch. This challenge is called Recovering from the Snap for 150 points in the Forensics category. Uh, it seems like a lot of people struggled aus? with this. Ist das der Baum? I saw a lot of questions about it just kind of flying around. I guess I didn't have too much of an issue with it. Uh, maybe I just, I, I, I don't know, maybe I just tried something different and it, was, it seemed clear to me, but I've got the file downloaded right here. It's animals.dd, whatever that may be. Uh, so I run file on it and I say that, okay, it's a DOS master group record root sector, code offset, this crap, blah, blah, blah. At that point, I, I, I see it's some kind of file system and I could deal with mounting it or trying to handle it or some other stuff, but at that point I didn't really care. I knew this is a forensic challenge, so I thought I'd go for and run my usual forensics, like low-hanging tools on it. So the first thing I reached for is foremost, because it's pretty effective, and I went into output, checked out what we got here. It looks like a lot of JPEGs. Cool. Maybe I could carve out files without having to mount the file system or deal with it or crap like that. And I get yeah, pictures of own. cute animals. Look at this puppy. He's adorable. This, <laughs> this fox? That is a fox, right? I don't know why, I don't know why I'm hesitant about that. Little frog here. Giraffe? Uh, me? <laughs> Ah, das war, waren das die Blätter? I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know. Maybe the the foremost tool is not commonly well known. Maybe it is, but I got it just like that. So I don't think it was that difficult of a challenge. But maybe it's just knowing your toolkit, knowing your arsenal, knowing things that can make your life easier. And maybe that just comes with playing a little bit more. Schleck. So, die Frage ist, gibt es hier noch was zu fluten irgendwo? Schauen wir mal in den Keller. Komme ich da rein? Oh no. Next challenge is called Admin Panel for 150 points, also a forensics challenge. It says we captured some traffic logs in the admin panel and we can find So you can download this file, again I already have. Oh, um, the killer is open. Let's check out this file because it is a PCAP file, so that is a packet capture. You can open that in Wireshark, you can have Wireshark installed, so you have to install Wireshark, blah blah blah, but it's the best tool for looking at PCAPs manually anyway, so I opened it up without actually supplying the file, my bad. And you'll see a lot of HTTP requests, and you'll note them because of their site. Uh, so you can explore each of them, and you'll notice that the packet information is listed here in the column. Hmm. And you'll see they were trying to make get requests to some kind of page. There's some interesting ones, though, because you'll see a post to a login request, a get eigentlich? to an admin page. So we can follow that HTTP stream and explore hmm. uh, the original request, right? Uh, the clients that's sending it in red, and then what the server responds with in blue. So this is the response. This is what the page returns to them. So it says, welcome to the website. If you were the admin, you'd be able to see all your settings here. Neat. Uh, peculiar, but at least we kind of get an inkling that, okay, also at, 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 at each of them, and you'll notice that the packet information is listed here in the column, and you'll see they were trying to make get requests to some kind of page. There's some interesting ones, though, because you'll see a post to a login request, get to an admin page, so we can follow that TCP stream and explore uh, the original request, right, uh, the clients that's sending it in red, and then what the server responds with in blue. So this is the response, this is what the page returns to them. 
So it says, welcome to the website. If you were the admin, you would be able to see all your settings here. Neat. Uh, peculiar, but at least we kind of get an inkling that, okay, at, at that at that packet or that communication in the server's uh, conversation, that point in the conversation, you can see that later on, there will probably be something happening referring to maybe another login or maybe viewing another admin page. So I see this post login, and I figure like, well, that, it doesn't have any get admin after that, so I figured, well, let's explore what that packet is. Let's follow that TCP stream. And again, you can see red of clients and blue the response here. The interesting thing is, posting those login, the variables that they're trying to post or supply to the web page are given as arguments here. So you can see user is admin and password is the flag, Pico CTF, not secure, blah, blah, blah. An interesting tidbit is that this is just HTTP, right? Not HTTPS. It's not encrypted or anything. So the responses and stuff and, and the requests that we're seeing across the wire are in plain text. So what we could potentially do is just go ahead and run strings on this data PCAP and you'll get all the information that you would have had otherwise at least visible in Wireshark. So what we can do is go ahead and use our magic grep to look for the file format. See if we can get Pico CTF with our regular expressions and just like that the flag pops out. So kind of a neat technique and honestly I did that before even opening up the Wireshark like literally before even opening PCAP and Wireshark, just because that's a quick and easy thing, good thing to do, right? So let's create a get flag script with just that, and we're good to keep rolling. Things to note, especially when you're handed a PCAP, is like strings is, is, is very quick if you're just going to be doing like simple analysis or just trying to find a needle out of a haystack, you know what I mean? Let's mark that challenge as complete. need to use the curly braces because I was flying their argument, but that is done. Let's actually go ahead and have it. Uh, crap. Let's get the flag out of that. And submit. Nice. So in this challenge, we're looking at assembly zero for 150 points in the reversing, reverse engineering category. It says, what does SM zero or ASM zero with these arguments return? Submit the function, I'm sorry, submit the flag as a hexadecimal value starting with 0x. And Assistant A is and zero. This question will not be the normal flag format, so it's not wrapped in Pico CTF. We're given the source, we can download it, and let's just kind of take note of the function and the arguments that are going through it. So I downloaded this already. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and assemble it, open it up in Sublime Text. Uh, I'll drag it over to the side here, and I'll create a new pane so I can look at it. I'm sorry, this, this stuff was when I was testing. So let's say we are running this function ASM0x2a and 0x4f, and we're given this function ASM0 in assembly here. So this looks like Intel syntax, and I've covered the difference between Intel and Z, so it's not wrapped in Pico CTF. We're given the source, we can download it, and let's just kind of take note uh -huh. of the function and the arguments that are going through it. So I downloaded this already. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and assemble it, open it up in some line text, uh, drag it okay. over to the side here, and I'll create a new pane so I can look at it. I'm sorry. It's, stuff was when I was testing. So let's say we are running this function ASM0, 0x2a, and 0x4f, and we're given this function ASM0 in assembly here. So this looks like Intel syntax, and I've covered the difference between Intel and AT&T syntax before, um, but right now we have just a super simple function, it seems like, really, really short, we're just trying to figure out what is the value, or what is being returned here, and in that case is what is the value of EAX, right? So the final value of EX once we are done at the end of this function here. So we have a little bit of stuff going on. For one thing, we push EBP for the base pointer, right? And we move EBP to ESP or the stack pointer. So these two things are the function prolog, right? Those happen at the beginning of every single function. So they're not incredibly important, at least not for what the function is, is, is really doing we want to see or care about. The next part it says it moves EIX to be this value, and this is EBP plus 0x8. So we know it's a word, we know it's some, uh, I guess, four byte information. I may be wrong on saying that, sorry. Um, but we, we've got a value at EBP, EBP plus 0x. So EBP is the base pointer, right? And we're using that as to where ESP, or where the stack pointer was, and it's pushed onto the stack. So when we get a function prolog, we're building out a stack frame for the specific function. So I want to go ahead and 
try to help you visualize that over here. Let's say this kind of block that I'm building is our stack frame. So we go ahead and we push EBP to some position on the stack, let's just say right here, EBP, uh, because above that, we had all the arguments that were originally pushed onto the stack in the original return address that would be where you would go back to in the code after this function were to exit. So that is what's above the EBP, or the base pointer on the stack. So let's say return address. And now we have the arguments that come that we would have originally passed to that function. Those are also pushed onto the stack before it. So those are the function arguments, or argument variables, about that. Normally, once you have variables declared uh, also inside the function, you'll have them beneath the EBP, or the base pointer, so local variables. And we can spread this out a little bit if you, if you want here, just to make it a little bit more visible. But what I'm trying to say is that EBP right now is our reference. And you can see that kind of literally in use within the code because EBP plus or minus will allow us to access different parts of like valuable information for us, like the return address, like the argument variables, or like the local variables. So these are all different. Like these are all separated by each other by a difference of four, or four bytes. So when we see EBP plus four, that means that we're referring to the return address. When we see EBP plus eight, we know we're referring to the first argument that we've passed to this function. Or, because again, that difference of four, it's just the next one on, the, on moving up. When we go to EBP plus zero XC, that's hex, right? It's just hexadecimal 12. So it's just four from zero X eight. So that would be the second argument that we've passed to this zero X four F. So that means we can kind of understand what these lines are doing. We can say that now EAX is being set to equal the first argument. So let's take note of that. EAX equals 0x2a. And the numbers may be different for whatever it is that you actually have in your code. But EBX is going to then equal 0x4f. So that works just there. EBX, right? Now we're saying EAX to equal EBX. EAX equals EBX, which ultimately means that EAX is going to end up 0x4f. And then we have our, punk, our, I'm sorry, our function epilogue, the very, very end of the function, where we say, okay, move the stack pointer back to EBP, go ahead and pop it off the stack, and then return. So that means we're at the very, very end of our function, we'll go back to where we originally were supposed to go because of our return address. But now we know the final value of EAX, or what this function will return, and that's going to be 0x4f, or the second argument that we passed to this function. Let's go ahead and copy it. Oh my God, go over here, you submit it. it. And we got it right, awesome. So that's that, that's just, that's just all there is to it. Uh, assembly zero was simple, right? But it just kind of took a little bit more of an understanding of what a stack frame looks like when you enter a function and just being able to know, okay, Intel syntax, reading from left to right, these are the arguments that are going through it and what it returns is, what it really means is the value of EAX at the very, very end. So if we wanted to, we could totally save that as our flag, 0x4f, and that's it. That's all we really need there. So perfect. Let's move that assembly challenge to be complete. And let's move into the next challenge here, buffer overflow zero. So it says, let's start off simple. Can you overflow the right buffer in this program to get the flag? We can also find it at buffer overflow, this thing on the shell server. We're given the source. Okay. So. I have this file, these files downloaded already, buffer overflow zero. We're given the source and the binary. Let's check them all out, yeah. The binary is vuln and the C source is vuln.c. So let's make vuln executable. And let's check out what the source code is here, vuln.c. I'll make this one big string. So we are in the main function. Let's go right there because that's the very start of where the program will, will begin. Noting, noting that C code, it tries to open up the flag.txt file, and if it can't read it, it says something is wrong, so that's fine. Uh, looks like we will probably need to run this on the server, so we, it gets us that flag file that we particularly need. And it looks like it will read it, set up a signal if it gets a psych fault to try and run this sigsev handler, and it'll get the UID and the UID, so it looks like it'll get privileges from whatever other uh, owner runs this file. 
and it'll determine, okay, if we have an argument, if arc c is greater than 1, Was it'll pass that argument, argument is. 1 to this voln function. Otherwise, it says, okay, it takes an argument. So voln does need an argument. It says voln, or vulnerable function, takes an input, about 16 characters, and it tries to copy it onto a buffer from our input. So we have a 16-character buffer that we just have to overflow and break, and supposedly it'll handle that segmentation fault once we overflow that buffer, overwrite maybe a return address as you saw just in that stack frame, because we're just this is a this is a function, right? So its stack frame has this local variable right below EBP and then right after it the return address. Oh. So we have to overflow a little bit more just to overflow EBP and the return address, and then we'll get a seg fault, because our program won't know where to go next if we like corrupt the instruction point. And that's what string cup will allow us to do because it's not going to check the length of our inputs. It doesn't sind to be better in the version of the STR yeah. or STRN copy where you can limit the amount of characters that it's going through. And in the handler for the function, the, the segmentation call, it will display the flag. So let's go ahead and try and solve this, right? Looks like we're going to have to do it on their server, so hopefully we can just copy this location. And I'll try and load this page and really, really hope it won't crap out on me because my internet, but we'll see how we do. Sean Hammond, YouTube. Looks like we're cruising so far. Try and zoom in a little bit so you can see this better. Change directory to that location. Go there. And looks like we have flag.txt that we could look at but we're not able to read it. If we actually check the permissions here, only buffer overflow zero is allowed to read it. Like if I, again, if I were to try and run cat flag.txt, I'm not allowed to. That's why we need to have that vuln function and the vuln.c where it is literally grabbing these permissions and trying to set them uh, as we read it. As, so this, this program will be allowed to read the flag, but we are not. Okay, so let's try and run vuln. It says it needs an argument. So let's give it a crap ton of A's, right? I'm just gonna hold down literally the A key, and it breaks, just like that. That's pretty neat, that's pretty cool, right? So what I'm gonna do next is just try and change that argument to some command substitution. So I'm gonna use a dollar sign parentheses and do some command substitution. I'm gonna use Python, and then tax C to just run a command as Python, and then I'm gonna say print A, or lowercase a, whatever we want, times Let's see, 16 was just the size of that buffer, right? And then if I try to pump that to 20, it says, okay, cool, we received that just fine. And we just overwrote the base pointer. Great. Now, if I were to go one above it, I would start to leak into the return address because we know that that's a difference of four, the four bytes for the return address. And it literally just some random A character is probably not going to be a location in memory. Like, even if it just intersects a little, just a little bit. Let's go 21. Let's see if it breaks. Oh, it doesn't yet. Kill it. That's fine. Let's go 22. Whatever. Maybe I'm wrong. I probably am. Let's go 23. Still nothing. What about 24? Are we overloading anything yet? Segmentation fault. Cool. Do I have a... Do I have a flag that's pumping out? I don't. What the heck? Maybe we're not returning this all the way that we should be. This is odd because I'm testing it a little bit more and I actually got the flag to come out with 29. It looks like 28 will get it as well, but 27 just gets a regular segmentation form. So I'm curious what is hitting that handler function and actually, and actually rolling it with it when otherwise it kind of the segmentation form on its own doesn't call that function. That's a peculiar thing, but yeah, I guess that blows some holes in what I was trying to explain, but uh, whatever, <laughs> bear with me. I appreciate you guys uh, watching and stuff, you know? So we got the flag. Let's go ahead and copy this. Um, let's jot it down and let's save it for this challenge. And now flag.txt. Great. Move that to be noted as complete. And let's go ahead and submit this. Yeah. Buffer overflow zero. 150 points in the bag. challenge is called Caesar Cipher 1. The challenge prompt here is, this is one of the older ciphers in the books. Can you decrypt this message? You can find the ciphertext at this location on the shell server, 
And I downloaded this file already, and let's move into that directory that I created for it. You can check out the ciphertext. It has picoctf, like the flag format we would expect, but the inside of the flag is kind of gibberish. So what I'm going to do is actually cut this up. Let's just get that uh, first portion here, and then I am just going to cut the other portion of it off, because I don't care what it is. And then I'm going to go ahead and try and loop this through a Caesar cipher. And you could do this with an online tool if you really wanted to. Just find like that decode.fr website or whatever that could, that could break in practice. But I'm going to try and do it from the command line because I think that's cool, right? So I'm going to pipe this into Caesar, tag, I guess whatever number I wanted. Caesar again is a, is a utility that's installed with pseudo app installed BSD games, with Rot 13. I, I've showed that a little bit ago. Uh, if, let's uh, say I want to use two or three or four or whatever. Um, so if I were to just loop through all of those, I can do the very beginning of the line for I in and in bash syntax, you use curly braces to note and then one dot dot to say range, and I'm going to go to 26. So let's have a semicolon there to start kind of the code block with do, and then I'll use Caesar dollar sign I, so I have a bash variable that will expand to whatever iteration I'm currently looking at. And then uh, semicolon to note the end of that command, or the end of the, yeah, that, that line in the code block, and then we'll make that code block finish with the done block there. So I'll hit enter, and we got all of these lines pumped out, and you can see blah blah blah, a little bit of English right here. It says, just a good old Caesar cipher, oh boy oh geez. Okay. <laughs> and that is what our flag's going to be, so let's just take note of that. Let's just say flag.txt, pico ctf, and I'll paste that in. You could probably detect this however you wanted to in, in, in that, but that's a simple way to just kind of get all the solutions. So let's go ahead and submit this, right? Submit. Awesome. All right, next challenge is called environ. It says sometimes you have to configure environment variables before executing a program. Can you find the flag we've hidden in an environment variable on the shell server? Yes. Let's go check out the shell server. I click over this link over here. See how my internet fares. Let's log in here. I am in YouTube. Enter my password. My password is password. It's like all capital A S S. <laughs> Alright, let's change directory. Do I need to change? No, 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 I just need to get the environment variables. So a cool command that you can actually just use to list all the environment variables is simply EMV. And you'll notice as we kind of take a look through this, we have mail path, these oh, things all kinds of stuff. And then the the Pico CTF flag set to a nice try, keep looking. But if we just kind of scroll up, you'll see secret flag equals Pico CTF environment variable flag. So since ENV will literally just display all of it, it's not too hard. We could script this if we automate our SSH connection, and maybe we'll do that later. But in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and submit this flag. Let's kind of jot that down. Though. We can move our Caesar cipher one to be marked complete, and then we'll just keep track of our environment flag. Just for good habits, you know? Next challenge is called Hertz. It says, here's another simple cipher for you where we make a bunch of substitutions. Can you dec decrypt it? And it gives us a netcat connection that we can connect to. So let's make directory hertz. Get in there. Hertz. Hertz. What the heck? Okay, cool. Whatever. Tab autocomplete was not having my, my day right now. <laughs> Netcat connect. It's all this crap where there's. The, the text seem, is seemingly different each time, um, but it should still, I don't know, potentially give us a flag if we wanted to. I'm just going to throw this in XSplit. If you wanted to, you, you could kind of copy all of it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and throw this to QuipQuip, which is a awesome tool, QuipQuip.com, that will essentially solve substitution ciphers, and it's kind of my go-to when I know it is a substitution cipher. So I'm just going to spit this in there, hit the solve button, let it like do its thing, run its course, do that voodoo magic, and we should eventually get some solution out of it. My internet connection is still crap. <laughs> Alright, it says, congrats, here is probably your flag. I don't feel the seeds. Substitution ciphers are solvable. Are, had no, had no, Via cloud. Maybe. 
Das war doch diese fliegende Base, da muss doch hier irgendwo dieses Feld sein. Oder? So I'm going to copy one more time. 
you paste it in, and just like that, simple stuff. So we didn't have to go through that whole process, although there is a lot of good documentation and stuff how to do it. Uh, I have a video from the 2017 SSH Keys Challenge, and again, Mr. Martin Carlisle has a, has a good video on it too. You can check out some of his stuff. Cool guy, awesome guy. Irish Name Repo is the next challenge. It's a web exploitation category challenge. It says there's a website running at this address with a given link. Whoa, sorry, I didn't mean to just kind of jump the gun on that. With a given link. Whoa, Was this this? sorry. It says there's a link. website running at this address with a given link. Whoa. Was hat er exploitation category challenge. It says there's a website running at this address with a given. Shell pickets. Link. Whoa. Sorry. I didn't mean to just kind of jump the gun on that. Do you think you can log in? Try and see if you can log in. Whatever. Let's open that in a new tab. The list of the Irish. That girl is a girl that is Allison Duty. All right, there are pictures here of Irish people, and there are, <laughs> it's funny, there are more pages, except they're not. I, I was really sad when this was happening, I just want to look at more pictures of preferably people who look like that girl. Uh, so there's a menu, there's a little hamburger button over on the top left that you can check out, and there's an admin login page. So you can go to login.html, and you can try and log in with some usernames here. Let's just try default credentials, admin and password, login failed. So try whatever you want it to, but that's just not going to work here. So the hint in this is it says, there doesn't seem to be any way to interact with this. I wonder if the users are kept in a database. So that's your clue as to what kind of attack this is. It's SQL injection. SQL injection being SQL, right? So structured query language, how you're interacting with the database or the structured query stuff. The SQL injection will kind of just allow you to inject specific database code or SQL into maybe how the server will interpret it and uh, you'll trick the backend server to thinking that what, you, what it would have expected as data, just what you are supplying, uh, except it's really code. So we can even use some of those easy, kind of low-hanging fruit, simple ones with an or one equals one or a condition that always returns true. See if we could log in. So I'm gonna try that just here. You can comment out the very end of it. And I've covered this in a lot of other videos before. You can see it in plenty of Pico CTF 2017 videos. It logs us in with the password. Awesome. It says your flag is Pico CTF Prime really isn't Irish. <laughs> nice. That's funny. If you wanted to get ready to get flag script for that, I'm not going to for this one. Irish name repo complete. I think that was the name of the challenge. Place the flag in there. And we'll get back to scoring points on the score better. I love it. Hey, what's up, YouTube? My name is John That's Hammond. Mr. This Robots. is another video right up nice. for Pico CTF 2018. This challenge is called Mr. Robots for 200 points in the web exploitation category. Challenge prompt is, do you see the same things I see? The glimpses of the flag hidden away at this link. So we can go check out this website. It says, Mr. Robots, hello, friend. So uh, I'm just going to listen from the challenge title and the name here. That this is a reference to robots.txt. So if you haven't seen that before, I cover it in a lot of videos because it's kind of just the most simple low-hanging fruit web challenge classic thing you can find in a CTF. So it's just a text file that explains pages that would not be kind of visible to a Google bot or kind of a web spider or crawler that's trying to index pages and stuff like that. So uh, we can go ahead and check out that robots.txt file. Let's go to the forward slash robots.txt in the URL. It says, for any user agent, so for any kind of web browser, go ahead and disallow this page. Don't allow them to get to that page. They're trying to hide it. But it is plain text. We can all see it. It's all accessible. So, so much depends upon the red flag. We can just go ahead and grab this flag right there and submit that. So if you wanted to, we could go ahead and make a get flag script out of that. Let's go ahead and just write like hey, I so I've been on so for this, this, and then let's get our flag format out of this super duper easy. Uh. Alright, just like that, we can save it. Again, my flag will be different than yours because of uh, the hex at the very, very end. I should have marked that as complete, my bad. Get flag script, bin bash, paste that in there, mark it as executable, go ahead and run it, save it. 
mark that challenge as complete. Easy peasy. All right. The next challenge is called No Login for 200 points. It says, it looks like someone started to make a website but never got around to making a login. But I heard there was a flag if you were the admin. So this challenge got a lot of flack. Uh, no one particularly liked it, <laughs> at least from what it seemed like. Uh, it says, I'm sorry, it doesn't look like you are the admin. I think this was kind of a guessing challenge or a leap of faith challenge, and that's why I think it got so much flack, because sign in and sign out aren't available. Um, if you check, if you try, try and go to the flag page, it says you're not the admin. So what we ended up having to have to do was creating a cookie. So I'm using edit this cookie. I'm just going to create a new one here. Uh, the name will be admin, and I'll set the value to one. Design. And now I refresh, go ahead and hit the flag button, and it gives me the flag just like that. So no real inclination or no real kind of point to do that. Just like maybe from your learning in the previous in the, in the, in the previous challenge where you had to modify the cookies. This time we had to add a cookie, kind of guess the value, the name would be admin, and set it to one or true, and you, you'd get a flag. So dumb. <laughs> Not my favorite thing, but whatever. Um, I'm just going to bang out a quick script for that. Let's make a directory, no login. I'll mark it as complete now because we know we've already got it. No login. Complete. And I just created a script, a Python script for it because I just want to be able to specify those cookies. Environment Python. Let's go ahead and grab the URL. URL can equal this. Let's import requests, which if you don't have installed, you can do pip install. And if you don't have pip, you can sudo apt install python hyphen pip. And let's just do requests.get url with cookies. That's a keyword argument I want here. Let's say admin and set it to one. And let's just say this is r for response variable. Let's print r.text. Looks like we do get the flag just visible there. Okay, so now let's go ahead and carve it out with some regular expressions. So let's do re. And then re dot find all pico ctf star asks for this to get it all, and we get that as our input. And we can go ahead and print that out. So perfect. Let's mark that as executable. Redirect it to flag dot text, and we're done with that. Awesome. All right. What's the next challenge? Do we want to see that? Still? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. Too many alt tabs. Alrighty. Now that that one's done, let's check out Secret Agent for 200 points. Another web exploitation category challenge. Here's a little website that hasn't been fully finished, but I hear I heard Google gets all your info anyway. So check this out. My new website with the flag. It says you are not Google, and it gives us our user agent or the header that's passed through HTTP or whenever you try and make a web request um, about what kind of browser that you're using. So it, it sounds like in this case order. we want to act as if we are the Google bot or the Google crawler to index stuff, like as if we were viewing it the robots.txt file. So let's try and figure out the Google user agent. Let's try to Google what the Google user agent may be. And Google Crawler's user agents. I had to poke around with this a little bit. Um, I think eventually it was the Google Bot or Google Auth thing that worked. I'm not sure which of these. Let's try this guy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this web address. I'm going to go to my terminal here and I'm going to use curl to go ahead and get the page. It says, you're not Google. And it says curl is our, is our user agent here. Let's specify a user agent. Curl can use tac tac user agent. And then I'm going to go ahead and paste in this information here. And it says, awesome, here's the flag, secret agent. So that one worked just fine. I use the user agent um, in curl. And you could do this if you wanted to with another Python requests module stuff. You can say headers equal curly braces and then the header. So you just send up a dictionary for the headers that you want to supply and you can paste in the header that you want. And then in your request, you would simply say headers equals headers. Or if you wanted to use a dictionary inline, you could do it just like that. So interesting thing, but I'm not gonna go through that one. I like the curl style here. And then we can just correct for our flag, carve it out. And if we're at ref, we need my process is awesome. And now that is our get flag script. Let's make a directory for that. It's called secret agent. Market as complete. 
and bang on a get flag script with our proof of concept stuff that we just did. Awesome. Redirect that to flag.txt. So that's that. Uh, some cool web challenges, some simple stuff. Uh, just kind of knowing your toolkit and knowing what is able to, to crank through those for you. Um, I think that it's kind of awesome to just know how we can manipulate those headers and those cookies whenever we need them, especially in code and in automation. So doing that in curl or doing that in Python is just going to benefit you later down the road for a lot more of these CTF style stuff. This challenge is called Truly an Artist for 200 points in the forensics category. It says, can you help us find the flag in this meta material? And you can find the file here, but we are given a download. So I have downloaded this, and just judging by the challenge prompt, I think we're going to be looking at some metadata. So let's check out what this file actually is. It is just an image file, right? PNG file for the of the logo, and we could do some stuff with it. If you want to run strings on it, you could do some nonce. Uh, it's like that actually pops up the flag pretty easily too. <laughs> so the the go to here, right, in, in this is, is running exit tool. And if you don't have exit tool already installed, just sudo apt install exit tool. But it will allow you to view metadata, right? So you can check out the man page for it. Why did that give me that? Uh, read and write metadata and meta information and files. So exit tool on Ooh, this file schlecht. will give you the artist, right? Hence the challenge title, truly an artist with Pico CTF looking image. So mm, oh, okay, I'm a easily too. So let's go ahead and just grab for our flag format and pump that to a simple get flag script. Pretty easy. Not too hard of a challenge. So cool. Follow through with all that. Let's more uh, chmod. Uh, I have this horrible problem sometimes when I'm recording. I wear a headset, right? And sometimes my 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 ear starts to itch, and it's just it's kind of bad. I like pause the video and just like, itch my ear. Weirdness. Ah, here's the spot. Okay. Like this is real as it gets, guys. This is salt and CTS for real <laughs> There's no filter. And John Hammond videos. All right, assembly one is the next challenge. It says, what is sm one zero x cd? So some hex value return. Submit the flag as hex. Okay, so we've done this before in assembly zero. Let's check out what this is. We have a source file that we can download, and I have it in assembly. I don't have it, actually. Let's get it. Study it. When I recorded earlier, my internet was off, so I tried to download a bunch of stuff, but I guess I'll just keep it this far. We can definitely get it real easy, get the link, and let's check out what we're working with here. Let's set the syntax to assembly, and if you aren't using Sublime Text or whatever, you can, if you are using Sublime Text, you can install that package, if you don't know the package manager, you can find that on Google or whatever. So, SM0, SM, SM1, sorry, let's take note of what we're trying to call this with. Just leave this comment here, so 0 CD. We have, let's, let's go through this line by line, right? Function, prolog. As usual, and let's do this. Oh, let's do a prolog page. More function prolog, and then we determine if our first argument, right? We cover that in the second zero, is greater than zero x v e. These numbers may be different uh, for how you're you're working on it because uh, just they're they're really cool random generation of, of challenges. So let's say greater than 0xcd should be greater than 0xdd. Oh. We can use Python to test these what? Are false. So we won't jump to part A. What the heck? Now we test if nice. ours is not equal to What is this here passiert? 0x8. So we're gonna go to part B. So let's jump down to part ich B. Ich dachte, man kann nicht mehr EX auf die Hölle oben drauf. Our argument. So EX can equal 0 x CD. And mm. we subtract 3 from it. So EX will now minus equal Vor allem wo? 0 x 3. So jetzt all die Steine hier weggraben und schauen, ob da runter das Loch ist oder wie. Ah, wie komme ich jetzt dahin? And now let's compare if... Our argument, 
if our argument, right, is not, so not, not 0xca, but 0xcd, if that is not equal to 0xep, that is not this uh, uh, so mushroom. To part C. Gräser. So part C ist das nicht das circa seltenste Biom? Which, again, is now being set to our original argument. So, zero wir denn die Teile rausgeflext? Das ist doch dieses Maschum, oder? Oh. So. Ja, jetzt ist der. Wow. Oh! Oder ist das immer in der Helle, dass das so äh, blau wird? Das kann natürlich sein. Now we go straight to part D because we don't have any conditionals. We're not jumping anywhere. It's not branching, and we have our function epilog. Okay, so our final value of eax should be 0x d0 in my case. Let's go ahead and try that. Let's submit 0x d0, and I'm wrong. All right, what did I miss here? Oh, 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 oh! I completely forgot to jump to part D. I don't know why I just like mentally missed that line. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I didn't mean to lead us all down that rabbit hole. That was stupid of me. Let's just go ahead and take our original argument minus three because after we subtract, then we go straight to part D and end the function. So we don't even need to worry about part C. My bad, I'm sorry. This is as real as it gets. <laughs> cool, that's correct. All right, thanks for bearing with me. I hope that wasn't too awful. Maybe it was still good for us to go through that process and read through some, some assembly together. Uh, Hopefully that's, that's still cool. Hope you still love me. I make mistakes, I'm human, it's whatever. Challenge is called Be Quick or Be Dead number one for 200 points. Um, challenge prompt is you find this when searching for some music, which leads you to Be Quick or Be Dead one. Can you run it fast enough and you can find the file there. So this this link is really funny because it just brings you to an Iron Maiden, uh, I'm sorry, an Iron Maiden music video. I don't know if I can show this copyright. <laughs> uh, some guys going crap for it's pretty cool. I thought it was funny. I liked it. Uh, and you can download this Be Quick or Be Dead um, file here. So I've got it downloaded already. Die we wachsen schon in der Hölle, oder? So Aber ist es hoch genug hier? And then let's run it. It says Be Quick or Be Dead 1, calculating key, you need a faster machine, bye bye. Okay, that sucks. So if you wanted to, you could try and reverse this thing. We're not given source code. So I'm going to use Hopper because. That's kind of my go-to, um, although Ida, probably a good thing to do. Uh, what am I, I'm in YouTube, Pico, and be quicker, be the one. So if you're, in high, if you're in Hopper, you can go ahead and check out, like, printing flags, stuff like that, print flag. You can just go to the procedures and check out the main function, see what we actually have to work with here. I'm going to go ahead and hit Alt and Enter, so we can see what we're working with. Header will simply just put and print out on the screen, be quicker, be dead, do a for loop to some characters and puts and that's it. Uh, set timer and what that does is it tries to set an alarm for I'm assuming one second just like that's what that is and when that ah, alarm is set that's aber, the aber ich go hier ahead big and receive signal to ich könnte halt and AFK gehen und well, auf der okay, nether Oberfläche uh, laufen machine, right? this alarm is what's going to happen und dann easy meine Sachen wiederholen, fällt mir gerade auf. Leute, ich glaube, ich mache das. Ich hoffe nur, dass ich da wieder hinkomme. Warte, da ist echt ein Pfeil. Soll man da weiter hingehen? Ist da hinten irgendwas? Ich 
If you don't know what theta is, by the way, I'm sorry I keep saying that word over and over again, that sounds very silly. That's not what I meant. <laughs> GDP theta is the Python Exploit Development Assistance Toolkit thing for GDP. So let's see, if I just run this, it will try and calculate the key. It'll receive the alarm and it'll it'll handle it, but it won't it won't end the program. So we'll just spit out the flag. So that's pretty awesome. That's pretty neat. That's pretty good for us. Uh, let's just take note of that flag. And if you wanted to, you could jot down like a solution.txt file because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna script that. That'd be that'd be stupid. Let's see if I can change my GDB init file and not run Peta. So if I just run simple GDB now, GDB with be quick or be dead. Simple run. Nope, it looks like I need Peta. Okay, peculiar thing. That's fine. Good to know. That's why I showed it to you. Peta will handle it just just fine, and it won't quit out of you once you receive that alarm signal. So all you have to do is get the repository, echo, like run that script in your GDB init, just as you saw mine, and then it will do its magic. So I think a lot of people like Pwn Debug as well, or other other add-ons for, for GDB that are kind of nice and awesome. Um, I haven't used enough of it, I'm, and I'm not that I'm not that good of a binary exploitation guru or ninja yet uh, to really know or use it that much. But Payton always seems to be okay for me, and it spit out the flag for this challenge. So neat. Let's mark that as complete. The next challenge is Blaze's cipher. Es ist richtig gut, denn dann kann ich immer auf K gehen und auch wieder zum Spawn zurück traveln. I had some technical difficulties for a second there. All right, cool. Blaze the Cipher. My buddy Blaze told me he learned about this cool cipher invented by a guy also named Blaze. Can you figure out what it says? Connect with this thing. So, Blaze Cipher, right? Google it. It's a reference to the Vigneer Cipher because it was created by this guy named Blaze. I would assume, I would hope that's how you pronounce his name, whatever. So. Whenever you hear references or you hear notions of Blaze or the Cypher Indecipherable or the Indecipherable Cypher, that's all kind of a, a pointer and, and a hint in reference to the Vigneer Cypher. And I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Visioneer, meh, folly. What's, do I have Blaze Cypher already created? Nope. Blaze's Cypher. Let's go ahead and try and connect to it, and it pumps out a bunch of gross information. That's fine. It's gibberish. It's Vigneer Cypher. If you wanted to, you could use some online tools, right? Vigneer Cypher Cracker. Decryptor or whatever. Decoder can do it. My Caching Profile can do it. And then try and determine the key once you paste it in here. Geocaching Profile takes a little bit of time. Ja, die Frage ist jetzt halt. Oh. Wie komme ich in die Hölle? So see how everything is uppercase in this or lowercase in that. They will try and handle it as either lowercase or, upper, or uppercase letters. Uh, and it normally Shall tries to remove yeah. punctuation to deal with stuff. So peculiar, peculiar, mm. but good to know and play with. <laughs> buffer overflow one. Okay, now you're cooking. This time you can overflow the buffer and return the flag function in this program. Sweet. We're given the program and the source code. We can download it. I've already W get it, but we'll have to run it on the shell server so we can actually receive their their flag file just as we've done before. So let's go check out what we've downloaded here. We have the source file, so let's go vuln.c. 
Check it out. It will define some macros here, so you kind of have a buffer size and flag size. We have a win function that will just print out the flag file. Okay, looks like that's how we can get the flag. And the bone function is just running gets, which we know is a very dangerous function. We can check out man gets if we wanted to. And gets. And it says never use this function because it has significant security problems. Sets a buffer up, raises our privileges so we can run on the server and get the flag, and then runs the vulnerable function. So it'll jump to an address, and that's probably what you can see this gets So that's me. Let's go ahead and try and run this function and see if we can work with it. Let's mark it as executable. Vuln, please enter your string. Awesome. And it says, okay, time to return, and it will jump back to where it expected to return to in the program. I could write, please subscribe or whatever stupid stuff, but we do want to try and overflow this, right? Uh, given Vier the ich doch. actual das ist doch buffer size base of 30 characters. You can see I entered a crap ton of A's, in der ersten okay, Folge. Return, Und wo ist dann das Fail? So, if you das auch? Leute, ich habe keine Lava und ein Steinschwert. Bei dem Dorf war ich nicht, aber irgendwo hier muss doch... Oh. Bin ich nicht einfach geradeaus weitergelaufen? Wieso denn nicht? Und 
to it. We'll enter our password. We're logged in. Let's get this just kind of in our directory or just output. So when I go back to get to the actual problems page, I can copy and paste it pretty easily. Let's get to buffer overflow one and we'll get to this location on the file system. Just copy and paste it. So let's CD over there, right? Now let's run the same command that we have. It says, okay, time to return, fingers crossed. We have overflowed and we told the return address to overflow and instead be our win function. And it pumps out the flag because we've called the win function just like that. Addresses are easy. Slick. Let's do that. Nano flag.txt. Save it. <laughs> Let's remove our cheesy please subscribe file. Submit it. Oh no. And the order. challenge is now complete. Oh yeah. What a win. Oh nice yeah. Buffer flow one. Wah. I am just going to solve the next challenge because it's pretty simple. Um, it's the identical, same thing, like same solution as the last Hertz challenge. Hertz is another substitution cipher, right? Just as we saw in the last one, so let's make directory Hertz 2. Hertz 2. Go ahead and netcat to it, get this string, and we can, again, just slap this in quick quick, and it works just fine for us. What is this for a reason, though? We will get the flag pretty easily. Substitution ciphers are easy. If you wanted to, we can get every other part of it and mark that and like, say what that is. And then Oops. we should know the rest of that string. Oh, do you okay? Das habe ich schon mal gesehen. Ich bin gerade auf. Okay, Leute. Äh, wir sind jetzt bei 2 Stunden und 9 Minuten. Dann würde ich sagen, was das für diese Episode. Ähm, ja, Laser Guckenland äh, ist erreichbar unter der IP 1.0.2.1.2.1.7.1.3.4. -2 Alternativ unter der Domain Silicon.com. Und wir haben das Video von John Hammond auf dem freecodecamp.org Channel gesehen mit dem Titel Improve Cyber Security Skills with CTFs, Pico CTF Walkthrough 2018. Link wie immer in der Beschreibung. Ciao.